Uh, well, thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to talk to you about automated testing with Objective-C, which is not a very popular concept, unfortunately. Uh, it's kind of sad. I actually came to this platform from .NET, and I became involved in the testing community there, and there was a, a pretty good community support behind it. And eventually, I uh, migrated onto the uh, iOS platform, and I was kind of sad to see the state of affairs when it comes to testing in iOS. Uh, but those tools are there. Uh, people don't talk about them enough. Uh, Apple certainly doesn't do enough, in my opinion, to, uh, to make this easy for us. But they are doing, uh, doing things. And what I'd like to do is uh, take you on a tour of, one, why I think testing is crucially important for our applications, uh, but also how to implement it and some techniques you can take home and uh, try today. So my name is Ben Sherman. I flew here all the way from Houston, Texas. It was a very long flight. <laughs> and um, I'm the director of development for a company called Chai One in Houston. Uh, we do uh, iOS, Android, and Ruby development. And I also, on the side, I do NS Screencast, uh, where I produce a, a bite-sized video on iOS development each week. Uh, you can find that at nsscreencast.com. Uh, and those are $9 a month. OK, so let's talk about automated tests. Why automated testing? If I could boil this down into one specific, one specific question for you, it would be, does your application work? And how do you answer this question? If you answer this question by running it in Xcode and clicking around a few times and try a few different code paths, you have reasonable confidence that it works. Uh, but that is not a very repeatable solution. The fact that you, you expended human effort to do one task one time. And as your application grows, you're going to want to test all the things that you just built, not the things that you did yesterday or last month or last year. And how do you know that the things that you're writing now aren't breaking things that you wrote before? And why do we even care about this? Why do we care that our application crashes? That's why we care. Because it is the quickest way to get a one-star review is to have your application crash. So I'd like to talk a little bit about automated tests. So what is it? It is code. It's separate from your application code. It is code that exercises the functions of your application. So here I'm just running a list of tests, and it runs through, and all of a sudden, oops, one broke. And that means that my test suite is indicating that my application is broken, and I need to fix it. So there are three types of tests that I'd like to talk about. And there's sort of a division in between each one. Uh, unit tests, integration tests, and acceptance tests. I'm going to focus mostly on the first two today, uh, just in the interest of time. But just know that I, uh, at every level, there's a way to test something. And it boils down to how do you want to describe the behavior of your application? And what do you want your test suite to communicate to you if it fails? So, a unit test should test one unit of functionality. And, uh, and if it breaks, it should tell you exactly why it broke. An acceptance test, on the other hand, tests broad strokes of functionality. And it may not tell you exactly what's wrong when it broke, but it does tell you when it broke. So here is an example of a unit test. We have this thing in the middle. It talks to these other objects. But we're going to isolate those in our test so that we're only testing one thing. An integration test is going to involve uh, one or more objects oftentimes will have side effects, things like a, a database, for instance. Uh, might happen in an integration test. And it's important to test these at, this, at both levels, right? If we test everything isolated by itself, then we have no proof that the whole system works together as a whole. Uh, so we're going to need to integrate two things together or two or more things together and test those as well. Those are called integration tests. Um, some people like to make the distinction, instead of saying unit and integration, they like to think of it as fast tests and slow tests. Uh, that's a good distinction, too, because as your test suite grows, you want to make sure that you're continually running them. And uh, if your test suite takes 30 minutes, guess what? People are going to stop running them locally. Uh, ask me how I know. Um, I like to think of these as when, it, when a, f a test fails, does it pinpoint the exact spot in the code where it's broken or not? And, uh, and ideally, you could go straight to the line of code and fix it. And acceptance tests involve the big picture, the whole thing. And oftentimes, they're driven through the UI, or at least maybe a thin layer underneath the UI. And these, by definition, are going to hit basically everything to and from your application, right? from the user interface 
through view controllers, through model objects, through the database, and back again, and, and testing that the user interface was updated appropriately. This is a customer-facing test, and it's generally written in customer terms. So when I'm writing an acceptance test, I'm painting broad strokes. I can't describe every aspect of my application using the acceptance test. They're too costly to build and maintain. Uh, they don't give me enough feedback on the process, uh, but it does give me one pass through. So for instance, an acceptance, an acceptance test on an application I work on logs into the system. It launches the application, it clicks on the button, it types in a username, it types in a password, it clicks the button, it actually hits our staging API, and comes back and asserts that we can log in. All of those steps, there are 100,000 things that can go wrong in there, and I don't want to test every single edge case in an acceptance test. For that, I will drop down to a much finer grained point, a unit test. So let's talk about what's in a test run real quick, because some of this terminology might be new to you. Uh, so test runs have a setup and a teardown, and these are run for each test. The idea is you wipe the slate clean and you start over for every single test. Uh, unfortunately, in Xcode, if you say file new test class, it will give you a comment that tells you that the setup runs before the test suite. And that comment is lying to you. Uh, and feel free to file a radar to tell Apple that. I did. That was for you. Uh, so in this case, I have two tests. My setup is being run twice. And my teardown is being run twice. So what's in a single test? I like to organize my tests in this style, arrange, act, assert. And arrange, act, assert is just a style of organizing your tests. Once you have your tests written, you're free to do whatever you want in there. Uh, and the test will fail if it fails any assertions in there. But I like to have this format. You set up the environment, you act upon it, and then you assert that certain conditions were met. And here's an example. This is called test adding numbers. I'm using this kind of weird like underscore naming here. Uh, this is not production code, so I don't necessarily treat it with the exact same rules I would treat production code. Um, certainly something that makes it more readable. Uh, but I don't know, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Uh, however, in XC test, you do have to begin all of your test methods with the word test, which is unfortunate. So in this case, I'm creating a new calculator. That's my arrange. Then I'm summing two numbers together. That's my act. And my assert is that the result was 7, or whatever x and y were. I think I'm running out of batteries with this thing. All right. And I really think I strive to make one assertion per test. Occasionally, I will add an, a second assertion uh, just to validate a precondition where the real assertion's at the bottom, but I really think it's valuable to have one assertion per test. This goes back to the, the driver that uh, as soon as a test fails, you should know why it failed. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Xcode. How does Xcode help us with this? So unit tests come by default on Xcode 5. File new project in Xcode 5, you get unit tests, which made me super excited. I hope it made you excited. And you can run those tests with command U. In addition, we got a new way of running unit tests and seeing individual test failures. So this is a new test navigator. It's on the left-hand navigator uh, pane. And uh, this is showing you a test run as it's happening and shows you individual failures. You can run individual tests. You can run a, a test class, or you can run the whole suite. So let's do a quick demo. I'm going to write a game, and I'm going to write it using tests. So let's uh, jump into Xcode here. My mouse does not seem to be cooperating at the moment. That is quite right click seems to work. Let me pull out a 
doesn't seem, I think my computer is messed up at the moment. Let's see if I can get this to work. Let me see if I plug in a mouse if it will work. Excuse me for a second. What I was about to do, and it will be much more exciting for me describing the code than actually writing it. Uh, just kidding. So the guess the number game is just a class. The class doesn't exist yet, right? So I'm going to write a test that asserts that I can create the class and that it's not nil. So I create a new class, test class. I write test can create game. I create the game. This class doesn't exist yet. I'm just writing the code I wish I had. And then I run xct assert not nil, pass in the game variable, and it fails to compile because that class doesn't exist. So then I go and create the class. At that point, I have a valid class. I can create it. It's not nil. So the next step, I decide the next behavior I need is uh, that it counts the number of guesses. So I have a guess the number game, and I want to be able to say, OK, you were able to guess the number in five tries. Uh, so I write the code I wish I had. I write something like uh, game add guess one and game add guess five. And then I assert that the game number of guesses property is two because I added two, uh, two guesses. Now this fails to compile because I don't have an add guess method. And I don't have a number of guesses property. So then I write the production code to make that satisfied. And I keep going across this, uh, this cycle. This is a particular uh, process called test-driven development. Uh, and it helps me create a testable design. You can certainly write the code and then write the test, but uh, doing it in that order doesn't necessarily mean that your design is testable. Doing it with the test first, it uh, forces you to be in that design. So one problem that we have when we come to write the test that says, how do we know what number we're going to generate? Because it's a random number generator, right? I create a new game class. It's going to generate a random number as the answer. And then I want to validate that when I guess the right number, it tells me it was the right number. And when I guess the wrong number, it tells me it was the wrong number. So uh, apologies for not having the code in front of me as I say this. But the, uh, the, the result to the guess method is going to return an enumeration that says guess correct or guess incorrect. And I'm going to write two methods, right? I'm going to, I'm going to write a method that says I'm, I'm giving an incorrect guess, and I expect that the result is incorrect. How do I know that the guess is incorrect? Well, maybe I pass negative 1, a value I know will never be, get picked. That one's easy enough. But what about the correct guess? How do I know what the random number generator is going to generate? This is a problem. I want to like peer inside of my class, but I don't want to make that answer value public. So if you take a look at this design right now, right now I have all my logic in the game class. And we have this behavior, this random number generator behavior inside my game class. And I want to get access to that so I can sort of modify it. So what I've done here is extracted this concept of the random number generator and brought it outside of the class into a new object. I call it random number generator because I'm creative. But there's this concept that why, is it, why does it need to be random? This is one specific type of number generator. And it would be really nice if I had sort of a formalized protocol called a number generator. And for that protocol, I could create my own specific implementation, a stub, if you will, that always returns the same number. That would be certainly useful in my test. So I can create a fake number generator. And in the generate number method, I return 5. Now in my test, I know that 5 is the right answer and that 1 is an incorrect answer. And I can write my unit test accordingly. So writing these stubs or fake objects that stand in for real objects is a really great way of isolating this object under test. I'm not testing anything about a random number generator. This is a unit test. So I'm testing the game class. So the number generator stub here, I can create that myself. You know, Just right there in my test class, I can create a stub. Or I can use a tool called OCMock. An OC mock will allow me to create a mock for a protocol or a concrete class. And it will generate this dynamically for me. And then I could say, OK, mock, expect to receive this message. 
Give me a number between 1 and 10. And when you do, I want you to return the value 5. So it's, it's like creating the stub manually, but you do it in a fashion where you can tell it what to return when it's called uh, specific methods. And you can also verify that these methods were called later. So if you wanted to validate that game was asking a number generator for an actual number, then you can use a mock for that as well. The term mock and stub, sometimes used interchangeably. Uh, to me, the key difference here is whether or not you want to assert some behavior of the stub, or if the stub is just a stand-in to let the rest of the code work. So I have another demo of the stubbing with OC mock, which I expect won't work. Uh, so I'm going to skip right over this one as well. Um, all the code, however, for, this, um, for these demos are available on GitHub, and I will make sure that the code is updated um, after this session. So I've talked about a really simplistic example, right? I, mean, I wrote a game class that is guessing the number uh, and has no UI, right? That's like the easiest world I could paint for you to start off testing. Um, but we work in iOS. We work with storyboards and interface builder and view controllers, right? So what, what do I do about these types of interactions, right? We want to validate that when I write a view controller that I've wired up the button appropriately, right? When I tap on the button, it should call this other method. When, I, when, I, uh, when that method is called, I should have some other piece of code be executed. And we can write unit tests for all this as well. So I want to take a quick detour. I showed you that calculator example, and that was a standard test unit style pattern where you have a test class, the test class has a setup and a teardown method, and you have a bunch of test methods. I much prefer the BDD style of testing where uh, you, you organize your tests instead of in test classes, you organize them in terms of context. So it's context, then specification. In this context, with a delinquent customer, when I do this, then my customer should get an email or whatever. Given when then. Sort of another way of saying a range act assert. So given some behavior, when I do X, Y should happen. So there are some tools for doing this on iOS or with Objective-C. Um, one of those tools is Specta. Specta is a framework for running these tests. And expecta is the matchers, which I'll, I'll call out the difference between those. But those two kind of go as a pair. I almost wish they were the same library. Um, it's a little bit of a weird twist on the Objective-C structure. Uh, so it is creating test classes and running them just the same as any other uh, XC test is. But it's done in a much sort of more friendly syntax, in my opinion. So we have a little bit of sort of we have to pay the tax to have compiled code and Xcode and not actually create classes. So they have some macros here for spec begin and spec end. And we can just kind of glaze our eyes over at that and pretend they don't exist. At that point on, we're describing a calculator class. And then everything inside of the block here is testing the calculator. So you can nest these at any level you want. So if you want to describe the calculator, and then you want to describe the calculator under some condition, and then inside of there, you have some subcondition of that condition or whatever, you can do that. At each level, uh, at each level here, these describe blocks or contexts can have a, they can have inline block variables like this. So I have a calculator instance. Um, I have to say block under under block because I'm going to modify this pointer in a block. Uh, and then I have a before each. The before each is just like setup in a test, uh, test unit style of test. So before each test, I'm going to create a new calculator. This is making sure I'm on a clean slate. And then I'm going to add two numbers together. And I, this is the cool part. I expect sum to equal 12. This, to me, is way, way nicer than saying xct assert equal sum comma 12 comma I write my own reason why it shouldn't have passed. That stuff should be inferred. And when this fails, expecta, this is expecta right here at the bottom, Expecta will tell me, it will raise an exception saying, you expected this variable to be 12, but it was 8. If I wanted to know the actual value of the, of the failure in the previous example, I would have to do a string format myself and substitute in the value. This will give it to me. It's a little bit weird. You've got some dot syntax stuff here. Uh, one reason why I like this um, is that 
It doesn't matter if I have no, like scalar values like ints or bools or objects. I can compare equality in the same way. So there's an alternative framework called Kiwi, which I also really like. Kiwi's matcher syntax is inferior, in my opinion, and I think they're moving away from it. Um, sum was an integer. And in Kiwi, you send a message to the object. You say, like, foo should equal bar. But we can't call messages. We can't send messages to an integer. So we, they have to wrap it in a value. So they say the value sum should equal the value 12. And for that reason, I kind of prefer Specta and Expecta a little bit more. Uh, but both frameworks are basically the same. They have the same syntax for defining tests. Unfortunately, both of these are kind of, uh, they don't get to play with the new XE testing tools in uh, Xcode. So we don't get the nice test navigator stuff. And I suspect we'll find a way to, to make that work in the future. Hopefully, Apple will, uh, will allow that. So when you're using Expecta, Specta, and Expecta, um, you'll leverage OC mock for mocks and stubs. Uh, you'll say OC mock object, mock for class, or mock for protocol. And then on that, you can call verify later on to ver validate that your uh, assertions were actually met. Kiwi has its own built-in, more powerful, I wouldn't say more powerful, but more palatable mocking framework built right in. Um, and both of them do uh, a good job at the, my next example, which is a really common one. Well, not my next example, the one after this one. So let's talk about how to test storyboards, right? We've got storyboards. It's instantiated view controllers for us. How do we know that we got the right storyboard or we got the right view controller? So at the top here, I'm going to get a reference to my storyboard. This is right inside of my test. I say, give me a storyboard with this name. Let me instantiate the initial view controller, which is a method on UI storyboard. I'm going to cast it to my view controller type and assert that it has a view. You might also assert that it has a table view or that it's a table view controller or whatever you need to do. But this is a really quick way of asserting that you have some behavior in your storyboard. So then we want to test some wired actions. Right? When I wire a button to a method, I want to assert that the uh, button actually calls that. So on my view controller that I just pulled out of the storyboard, I'm going to call, I'm going to access its login button property. And there's a method we can call on any UI control, actions for target for control event. And I did a little font trick here so I can make everything big except that long enumeration. That says the control event is UI control event touch up inside. And that will give me an array of actions. And I expect that there is one element in this array, and it is the string login tapped colon. So if that event is not wired up in Interface Builder or Storyboards, then this test will fail. So now um, I want to talk about testing block-based interactions. So many things that we do in an iOS application is asynchronous. We talk to the network. We talk to the database. We save a file. We do all these things. And we want to get them off of the main thread and do them asynchronous. And we'll get called back later. So there's this block-based pattern that's happening everywhere. A lot of Apple's new APIs have them. A lot of third-party frameworks have them. We have GCD at our disposal, so we use blocks all the time. So I want to describe a scenario, a simplistic one. But we have this external API that we want to log into. It takes a username and password via HTTP call. And uh, my object that I created to interact with that is called login service. And it's a block-based API. So I say login service, login with username and password. And then I give it a block for what to do when that result comes back. And then my view controller talks to the login service. I've decoupled my view controller from the act of logging in. But I want to make sure that when the login is invalid, my view controller does a specific thing. And when my login is valid, my view controller does a specific thing. Both those things I want to test are inside of a block that I'm passing to another object. So to describe this interaction a little bit more clearly, the view controller calls login service. It passes in a block that looks kind of like this. This block takes in a user. Right? This is the user that was just logged in. If the user is non-nil, meaning we have a user, then I'm going to treat it as logged in. 
And if it was nil, then I'm going to say you're not logged in. Now, mentally replace these NS log statements with changing the UI or calling another method on your view controller, or maybe in an invalid case, maybe pop up an alert and say your login is invalid, whatever. The logic I want to test is inside this block, and I'm now passing this off to another method. So then that calls the external API. The external API uh, returns the result. The login surface interprets the result, and it invokes the block with an argument. Now, this is a unit test. So what, are the th what is the thing that we're testing? We're testing the view controller. The view controller was the one who created the block that we want to test. And so we're isolating everything else. So what that means is I'm not actually calling an API. I'm not actually talking to a real login service. I'm talking to a fake login service. And using OC mock, I can do this. So the view controller is my system under test. I'm going to mock this guy. So step one is verify that my login service was called at all. Right? The way we do that, I'm doing the describe style of testing here using Specta. So I'm describing the act of logging in. And my test is it should verify username and password with a login service. So I'm not testing what happens when the login service returns a result. I'm just testing that I called it at all. The way I do that is I create a mock login service. This is the code that you would write with OC mock to create a mock for that login service class. And then on the mock login service, I expect that a method was called. And that method is verify username, password, completion. So I'll, I'll pause on this part because uh, if you haven't done mock objects before, this can be a little bit confusing. I'm expecting that a method is called. Before I do anything with my code, I'm just expecting that it's called. And the arguments here are going to be matched. So if they call it with user2, it's going to fail. Because I didn't expect user2, I expected user1. And for password, I expected password1. For completion, I used this special OC mock, uh, OCM arg class to specify that I don't really care what was passed for that third block the third argument. So it's only going to verify the first two. OK? So we're still in a range mode. Now I'm setting up some context on my view controller. I'm telling it, your login service is the mock login service. And then I'm setting the text fields for username and password to the values that I expected to pass to the login service. Finally, I tap the button. And then the last line is my assertion. I validate that that method was called. OC mock runs, since I'm running with a mock object, and my view controller is pointed to the mock object, it's recording all my interactions with that object. And later when I call verify, it will say, oh, well, I expected you to call this, but it wasn't called. Or perhaps I call it with different parameters. It will fail right then and there and say, I expected you to call this method with user1 and password1, but you called the method user2, password2. And so it'll fail there. So this, all this does, Validate that we're passing the right parameters over the login service. So we have our second test. To define the behavior when the login service calls back. We have two cases here, success and failure. If I pass in a valid username and password, I should get some block called with a, with a user class. And uh, for the invalid case, uh, that argument would be nil. So here's my second test I'm going to write. It should welcome the user when the login is valid. So again, I start off with a mock for my login service class. I have the exact same uh, style here of expecting that method to be called. In this test, though, I don't care what parameters are testing. Right? I don't care about the arguments, because I already tested that on another test. So these tests have very similar look and feel. But when it fails because I didn't pass the argument, that test is going to fail. And when I pass the right arguments, that test will pass. So what this is telling me, I have this dot, dot, dot for the completion. That's what we're going to zoom in on here in a second. So we're zooming in on that same mock call. But for the completion, I'm using OCM arg check with block. This is basically saying, OK, when the method is called, and you're validating all the arguments that were passed into the method, I want you to execute this code to determine if that argument is valid. And this is my chance to intercept the block that was passed to this guy and call it. So here I'm creating a mock user class. 
and I'm calling a completion block with that mock user class. I can also do my own expectations on the user class, like maybe I, was, I expect that something's going to happen to it, or whatever. Or I can just stub some values, like maybe I stub that when you ask for the username property, I return Ben. And then uh, just a little bit of housekeeping for this sort of block uh, to work. I have to return yes that this argument is valid. So this, this, I'm sort of using this as a dual purpose thing to intercept the block that was called. Now this pattern has a name and it's called spies. Some, some frameworks call it spies. Um, and basically lets you intercept arguments that were passed into a method, uh, to a mock object. So that's a pattern that I use all the time to test that blocks were called and what happens when I call the block with nil or call the block with a user and that the view controller does the right thing. You have to get an access to the block that was passed into that mock object. So I've talked a lot about unit tests and a little bit about integration tests. Uh, for acceptance tests, uh, I think it's important to explore the various options we have here. I have some experience with KIF. KIF stands for Keep It Functional, and it has an Objective-C uh, interface for tapping on buttons and waiting for elements to appear on the screen and things like that. So it'll fire up the simulator and you actually see it tap through. Um, and there's some value in writing tests like that. They're much harder to maintain than unit tests. So I would say as you go down this spectrum of you know, describing your application's behavior in broad strokes like with something like KIF, that you drop down into another level where your tests are faster and more uh, precise. And the amount of tests you have should increase as you go down to the unit test level. Right? We should have lots of unit tests, some integration tests, and a few acceptance tests. Right? It's a pyramid. Another tool you might look at is Frank. Frank offers you a cucumber style testing interface um, similar to KIF. It will drive the UI of your, your application, but it will do it through like a, some uh, magic web server that runs on the iOS app in test mode so that it can intercept uh, HTTP calls and actually tap the buttons. Um, and then there's another one you might look at, which is UI automation, which there's actually a really good book by Jonathan Penn uh, talking about how to use UI automation for acceptance tests. So uh, before I go, some parting tips. If it's hard to test, your design probably needs some improvement. And this is probably the biggest barrier when I talk to people about testing. Uh, they want to go apply this to the project they're currently working on. And uh, then they look at this view controller that's got a thousand lines of code in it. And they don't know where to start. right? And I would say your first problem is your view controller has a thousand lines of code in it. Uh, so start to decouple things. And if you start with test first, this exposes it right away. We, we found this out in the game class that I needed to extract out the random number generator thing so I could test it properly. Try to test one and only one thing. If you have a test method that's testing this and then assert, 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 it will break for five reasons. And then you're not going to know which one is the actual case that happened. Uh, if you have to set a breakpoint to understand why your test failed, it's probably not a great test. But at least you have a test. So, If you write tests first, you can avoid creating untestable designs. And I would say use a continuous integration server to, I mean, you can run command U on your machine before you check in, uh, but you may forget to do this, or your colleagues may forget to do this and check in code that's actually broken. We use a continuous integration server called Jenkins, and it runs all of our tests. Uh, when the tests fail, it pipes a message into our hip chat room saying, hey, Ben broke the builds. And public shaming is really good at changing behavior. And the last tip I'll, I'll offer up is practice. Because this stuff doesn't come easy. The mock object thing is a total mind bend. If you've never done it before, uh, it takes a little bit of getting used to. But these patterns keep coming back, the same patterns. Testing things, isolating things, mocking and stubbing in all languages, Ruby, Java, C Sharp, Python. All, all of these languages have the same types of tools, the same vernacular. So these, these uh, techniques for testing, you can take them across multiple platforms. Um, I will say that practice is the only way that you're going to become comfortable with unit testing. And I think as a community of iOS developers, uh, we need to be testing our apps more.
So I think I cut it a little short because we didn't have the live demos. Uh, I'll make sure and have this code available to you at this URL here at the bottom. These slides are also available already at speakerdeck.com slash subdigital. Um, they'll also be made available through the, uh, uh, the conference organizers. So I think I have some time for questions. Community, or, or is that something that um, uh, testing is something that you're trying to advocate? So the question is, is there a lot of testing going on in the iOS community? Uh, I would say no. Most people I interact with, um, they recognize that it's a good idea, but when your fingers reach the keyboard, you just go into Interface Builder, drag a thing, and forget that there's all this testing support in Xcode and some of these third-party libraries. So it's definitely something that I'm trying to advocate more and more. I am finding, though, that as I talk to more people, there are more people that are coming from other platforms and starting to bring that, that uh, sort of test infection nature. And there are people doing legitimate TDD on iOS. But I will admit, it's certainly harder than it was than it is in Ruby. I spend a lot of time in Ruby, and testing in Ruby is really, really nice in comparison. Hi. Um, do you uh, recommend test-driven development for all types of apps, or is there some place you would not recommend it? Um, I think you have to always like weigh the, the benefit of what you're doing, right? the cost-benefit analysis. In many cases, an improved design will make your testing easier. And then, in my mind, there's no question. If it's easy to test, we should test it. Um, there are things like games, which have inherent logic things that are easy to test. But testing that a pixel is in this spot right here is probably really hard. Um, so I probably wouldn't test that. Um, I don't know. I mean, definitely be pragmatic about it. Uh, I don't necessarily think we need 100% test coverage. Uh, and I think uh, that you know, if we strive to test uh, the complicated parts of our code, the things like, to give you a concrete example, uh, the app I work on doesn't have a lot of tests. And I wish it had more, because we'll inadvertently break something that worked six months ago. Um, but there's some core pieces uh, that are inherently logic-based, like inputs and outputs, that are so easy to test, there's no reason why we can't test them. So I think there's room for some amount of testing in every application. Uh, my answer would probably be a little bit more bullish if this was a Rails app, because I know that it, the capabilities and the speed of testing is probably a bit greater there. Uh, but that doesn't mean we can't start with step one, which is to write some tests. Uh, yeah. Writing tests for uh, code that are kind of like utils is uh, comparatively much easier. But let us, and uh, here you took the example of the view controller and mock the logging service. Okay, let's say that the login service, all that it uh, has to determine whether it has succeeded or failed, then the view controller has two paths. Mm -hmm. But where I really face uh, the unit test to be challenging is something like, let's say the login service is, uh, has implemented an NSURL connection delegate. Then it, has, it is getting the data. Specific to that data, you might check CRC or something inside it. Means that has implemented the delegate, and there can be like tons of different kind of data. And the login yeah. service is not just a plain util; it has a state. It it might have many states, many error states. Sure. So uh, that is one area that I face very challenging in terms of uh, putting any tests there. If the number of behavioral states are high, so what exactly can we do for a delegate callback uh, mocking yeah. and so, uh, a high number of states? To be tested. So I would I would say if you have a lot of state being tracked by one class, that perhaps there are more concepts that we could start extracting out into smaller pieces that are easier to test on their own. Um, if I understood your question correctly, uh, what about all the different API responses that could come back from NSURL uh, connection? Uh, those can be stubbed, and I think you have to walk a fine line of whether to uh, to actually mock classes that you don't own uh, because. They're complex, right? And you don't own their behavior, and you may not be uh, fully equipped to cover all edge cases. Uh, but there is a tool called uh, OH HTTP Stubs. It's a third party library, and that will help you test things that interact with NSURL connection. And you can provide canned responses. So you can say, this was what a valid login response looks like, and this is what an invalid login response looks like. So you don't actually have to hit the API uh, in your test. Because if you actually hit the network in your test, it's going to be pretty slow test suite.
code. Let's let's say you have written uh, code which is not testable. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, L of mud, and I'd like to write some tests for it, but but it's this thing, and I don't really know quite how to attack it. Uh, one, there's a really good book called Refactoring. Uh, Working effectively with legacy code, that's the title of the book. And it has some common patterns of what you can do. Um, I think the best thing you can do is start finding those logical chunks of functionality. Um, cover the whole thing in one broad acceptance test. Does it work or does it not work? At least you have something to know if you broke it. Uh, and then take one small piece of functionality and rewrite that. You know, use common refactoring patterns. Extract method, extract method. Eventually you start extracting classes. Um, it's definitely hard. I inherited an application that had about 4,000 lines of logic of what types of vaccinations different people would need based on their age and what they had already. And the people who wrote it were, uh, I just think they were mean. Uh, <laughs> but I was like, I don't even want to touch it. I have no idea how this thing works. Um, and really, you have to just approach it one step at a time, try and find the right patterns for applying refactorings, and uh, take small steps. Another question, uh, can you talk about code coverage? Code coverage. I'm not a huge believer in code coverage. As a tool, it can give you feedback of whether or not you're actually increasing your test coverage, which is a good thing. Um, I know a large software company based in uh, Round Rock, Texas. Uh, Dell, I guess I should say. They're no longer a public company. <laughs> uh, at one point, mandated that they had to have like 85% test coverage or whatever. Uh, and so what this team did, well, they're like, well, I can't check in this code unless it's covered. So let me just write a test and have no assertions, right? It just calls the code. It doesn't val validate that anything worked or didn't work. Uh, and guess what? They had good test coverage. It's, it's an easy number to fake. So um, I don't monitor this at all for iOS apps because I know the number is low. Um, we, um, it's easy enough to plug into something like Ruby. Uh, but I'm sure there's tools available that can give you the test coverage number. Uh, I would just say don't tie any kind of like strict numbers that you have to do this or, or you can't check in code. Cool. Any other questions? Hi. Uh, there are a lot of uh, scenarios we face where we're using a third-party library or a third-party framework. And uh, our code uses that quite a lot of times. But now that we don't have the source for that available, how do we test such unit, you know, if we have to write unit test cases for such functions, which use them, but we mm -hmm. cannot set up our environment correctly? How do we go about that? Uh, so it's, it's kind of a hard question to answer without speaking concretely. Um, there's a couple of techniques I would use. Uh, one is to create like an adapter in between your code and third party code so that you can mock some interface. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question appropriately. Do you have a, a realist example that you could share? Uh, I, I'll just try and explain it a bit more. Okay. So what happens is uh, there's a framework which you're using, and after a few network calls, certain values are you know set inside that piece of framework, mm -hmm. which I cannot uh, explicitly set. So they're like kind of read-only values. Right. And now when I have to set my scenario to test a particular unit of code correctly, I need those values to be set, but I practically have no access to them. So yeah, that ends up. This, this reminds me of a specific example that Scott and I were discussing over dinner. Uh, he was talking about was it threading in Java and accessing account property while another thread is trying to add an item to a collection. And, and in his case, it was very handy to expose the internals of, of uh, some class so that he could just set the value and test the scenario without actually going through the motions of, of doing that. And I think that uh, can be somewhat dangerous if you just always access the internals of some class. Um, one trick you could use if those things are internal but you want them to be public is to create a category method that exposes that uh, method signature publicly, and it will work. And what if, I mean, what if the, you don't know what exactly lead that function does internally. I mean, maybe it's setting multiple parameters. Maybe it's doing a lot of things. So even if I write an extension for it, extension for it. Yeah, I mean. you wouldn't know which one it was. Um, you can certainly use class dump. Uh, it's a command line utility. We'll just dump all the headers. And you could take a look at it that way. Um, ultimately, I think that when we're faced with challenges of like, I don't really know how to test it. It's a part of total development effort, just for estimation purposes. So. I want to be careful about answering that question uh, because I suspect that what you mean is 
you need to account for some time that we take to write tests. Um, and I think we need to look at that in a different way, that when I write tests, it is saving me boatloads of time down the line in manual retesting, or if a bug slips out. Um, there's a well-known study uh, that talks about the, the cost of fixing a bug. And if you just wrote the bug, the cost is essentially zero because you know what you just did and you fix it. If you wait a day, you have to remember your mindset, right? And if you wait a week, it becomes even worse. If you wait a month or if your customers tell you, it may be a different person altogether that has to fix this bug. The cost of fixing it is way, way more expensive than fixing it in the first place. So um, uh, I, I maintain that you should not have to ask permission to write unit tests, right? It is writing more code. And a lot of people will sh like to share their code coverage numbers. Uh, like on our Rails app, we have probably, um, I'm trying to think of specific numbers, but we have almost one-to-one -one test code line, of line count and production code line count. It's probably you know, 0.8 to 1. Um, in some cases, you have more test code than you have production code. It just depends on the level of testing. But those tests, they're well written. They're going to save you way more time than it took to write them in the first place. So for me, it's like, this is a feature, and the cost of doing the feature is doing it right. Yep. Uh, hey, Ben. So with regards to testing uh, third-party libraries, uh, uh, I've had this conversation with my director, uh, Ron Lyle. You might know him. Yep, I know him, uh, yeah. Uh, he's kind of an expert in unit testing. And uh, one way we think about it is uh, we test all the code that we write. And so uh, it's almost impossible, to, for example, to test the libraries that, uh, the libraries frameworks that Apple has provided us. Right. And we try to pick third party libraries that already have unit tests, like AF networking is. Uh, mm -hmm. tested pretty well. Um, so uh, what do you think of uh, that philosophy that uh, yeah, I, leave, I alone the, leave alone the uh, code that someone else has written, just worry about what you're writing? Right, and uh, that goes back to just being aware of the code that you're choosing to bring into your frameworks. I fully agree that you shouldn't test third-party code. That's not your code, and it could change without you knowing it, and the tests you write may not uh, reflect the actual... Uh, behavior of the application. Uh, essentially, that to me means you're doing their work for them for your sake, for your benefit to make sure that if their behavior changes, that you know about it. That should eventually be covered by some broad level test, uh, but certainly not full coverage against some third party API. Um, but occasionally, in fact, very often I'll use testing as a means of exploring an API to see what, what happens when, like, for example, Apple's API for in app purchases. I read all the documentation, I watched all the videos, but what actually happens? What do the JSON documents look like when I get them back? And uh, one way to do that is to do it inside of a unit test so that you can actually see the result. Now, those are throwaway tests. Um, but yeah, I would not spend any time writing tests against Apple's frameworks or any third party framework. Cool. Is that time? Okay. Thank you so much for coming.